Welcome, everyone. In this uh, talk, we're going to look at three identity and access management examples, and we're going to explore how a uh, business might evolve their applications in order to solve uh, their digital transformation needs and how those applications evolve in order to solve the, the challenges of, of modern identity management. My name's uh, Jared Hansen, and I'm uh, the chief architect at Auth0, and for those of you familiar with Node.js, also the creator of, of Passport.js. All right, the, the scenarios that we're gonna look at in order to, to illustrate identity and access management and, and the modern needs of it are, are the following. We're gonna start out with a basic website. Now, that's not super interesting, but uh, I think it's important to start there just to set up some concepts. Um, we're then gonna look at enterprise single sign-on and API platform and integration. And we'll kind of compare and contrast that to the basic website. I find that a lot of developers as they start to uh, do these more advanced features, there's a lot of confusion and complexity that they don't understand, and if we can relate it to what, what is familiar, that's often, often helpful. What do we mean when we talk about digital transformation and its role with identity and access management? Well, with a basic website, things, things were super simple, right? We just had a single application and a single set of users, and, and no one really had any problems. But uh, people want more features, so if you want to support enterprise use cases, you need to be able to sign on employees from other businesses. Uh, you might have partners that want to sign on to your own apps. As soon as you start allowing uh, other businesses to sign on their employees, they're going to want to integrate their uh, business, business processes and software with your software, so now you have to deal with API platforms and integration. And these are the things that, that modern identity uh, tools and protocols can help us solve. All right, so let's, let's start with the basic website. As I said, like, this isn't super in interesting for you know, digital transformation efforts, but it sets up some concepts that, that we'll use later. As we go into this, I'm gonna look at a few different perspectives on the problem. We're gonna take a look at you know, the typical flows that a user might see, uh, and we're gonna dig deeper into the data model and some of the network traffic that goes on. Uh, because identity kind of touches all aspects of an application, I think it's important to get these views so there's some understanding of, of how things fit together. So to start off with, the data model for a simple website, not, not surprising here. We have a users table with a bunch of user profile information, and we have a projects table with the projects that that user manages. Uh, there's probably a number of other application-specific stuff, but, but that's not the point of this talk. As a user interacts with identity uh, in a simple web application, there's really two touch points that are common for the user. Uh, the, first, the first one is a sign-up prompt, we need users to come to our website and sign up for our service. So you see these things all over the web, it looks something like this. The user just sees a linear progression where they enter their user details, create a password for this website, uh, supply any other information that the website requires, they hit submit, and then they see some welcome or landing page which introduces them to the service and how to use it. If we get into the network requests, it's a little less linear because there's traffic going back and forth between the server uh, and the browser. Uh, again, this is all pretty simple, but the only thing that happens here is a post request to a sign-up endpoint uh, with the information that the user filled out. In this case, Alice is registering a new account. The server gets that and then redirects Alice to the welcome screen. That round trips through the browser, and finally the browser uh, fetches the welcome screen and Alice sees it. Not too surprising. Connecting this to our data model, again, really simple. All that happens in this post request is that our backend creates a new user record in the database, and we now uh, have persisted Alice's information. I'm gonna introduce some terms as we go through that, this. The first is that of a directory. A directory is simply a local database where the user information gets stored. Uh, it, depending on how you're building your backend applications, this might actually be an LDAP or Active Directory that uses standardized protocols and schemas. Uh, it might also just be a NoSQL no or SQL database where developers have just uh, had proprietary schemas that they put in there for convenience. It doesn't really matter, either one suffices, we just need a way to store our user information. The second place users will encounter identity in these applications is obviously the login prompt. So Alice has already signed up and created an account at, at our service. And every time she returns, if she needs to log in, again, very simple, she just fills out her username and password, hits submit, and then sees the dashboard with the various projects that she manages. 
Looking at the network traffic, again, this is all pretty simple. Uh, we post the credentials to a login endpoint. The server verifies those credentials. If everything checks out, uh, the server redirects Alice to the dashboard with a session cookie, and the browser fetches the dashboard, and Alice sees her projects. There's nothing too interesting here. The only thing I do want to call out is that of the session cookie. Um, a lot of developers can sometimes find this mysterious because uh, web frameworks will typically manage all this process for you so you don't encounter it often in your development process. But what's going on here is that HTTP is a stateless protocol, which basically means every request that our application sees is disconnected from any previous requests. So if you look at how Alice logs in, she first submits her password to the login endpoint, uh, and then she navigates the site and fetches the dashboard, maybe a project-specific page, but her password is never submitted again. So how do we continue to identify Alice as the subsequent requests happen? Well, the trick here is, is what's going on in that session cookie. That initial login request basically validated her credentials and then tokenized Alice's information. So we recorded the fact that Alice is logged in, her user ID, and then we might stash that information in a, in a cache like Redis so we can look it up quickly. And then as, as she requests new pages, we just load that same information back out and maybe render her profile name and picture in the upper right-hand corner, something like that. But the session cookie is just the tokenized login information from the, from the first request. The term here, session, uh, this is just the state shared between a browser and the host serving web pages. And it typically happens via cookies. If anyone is familiar with connection-oriented protocols or other protocols, the session might have a slightly different meaning with different nuance, but, but this is the, the definition for web applications, and, and that's what we'll focus on here. If we zoom out of this application and take a look at it, uh, what we have is obviously, again, very, very simple. We have acme.com, which is the domain our application is running on. We've got a set of web servers and a database for all the user records. And then we have users out there with, with web browsers who access our site and, and use the application. Uh, the important thing here as we go forward in this talk is the notion of a domain, which is acme.com. And the domain is just the, the collection of computers that share a common security policy and the users that they manage. So in our simple application, we have one domain, acme.com, uh, with its set of servers and its set of users, and it doesn't talk to anyone else. If we were going to build this out more, there's a bunch of other things that we would have to do to actually have a fully functioning and secure login system. We'd have to do all the password hashing, uh, complexity checking, resets, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we're not going to go into any of that business in this, these talks. Uh, we're, we're just going to focus on the basics and kind of get the high-level understanding of how everything fits together. All right, let's move on to the more interesting aspects. What actually happens if we want to solve some of these digital transformation efforts? The first one we'll look at is enterprise single sign-on. So if we are building a service, uh, in our case, our project management application, and we want to start tell selling to businesses, and then having the employees of those businesses sign on to our application, how do, how do we make that happen, and how does it relate to the, the basic website that we had before? One of the constraints in this whole talk is that as we build up this application, we don't want to overhaul any of it in major ways as we add new capabilities. We'd like to reuse uh, the things that we have so that you know, the development effort can, can be as seamless as possible. So the constraint here is that we don't want to be changing the existing data model of our application. So here's the data model when we add support for enterprise SSO. You'll notice that the users table and projects table are exactly the same as before. We have our user records, we have our project records, and those continue to be related. We inter introduce a few new tables here uh, to handle the SSO um, features. Specifically, we have organizations. These would represent our business customers. Our business customers have SSO servers, so their employees can SSO into the applications. That's covered by the identity providers table there. And then the external identities represents basically, as the employees log into our application, we keep track of them so that we know what account uh, they're accessing. I want to take a bit of a diversion here and talk a little bit about what is digital identity and, and what do we mean when we say that. Uh, the term identity, I think, if you hang around conferences like this and get involved in it like I do, like, it, it gets pretty philosophical at times, and, and that can be a bit of a distraction to what we're actually trying to accomplish, especially with authentication and authorization. So I like to boil it down into just two things, that of an issuer and an identifier. And the issuer is basically the organization responsible for issuing an identity. 
and the identifier is a user's specific account identifier. I like to think of this in real world terms if you look at a bank, for instance. A bank issues account numbers to its customers. Uh, so the bank, in my case, like I bank at Wells Fargo, so Wells Fargo would be the issuer of my banking identity, and then the account number would be my actual identifier. How do you get a bank account at a, at a bank like Wells Fargo? Well, you have to walk in there and pr present another form of credential. So in my case, I would have to present my California driver's license so that I prove that I am who I am and they know who the customer is. That would be another form of identity where the issuer is the state of California and the, my driver's license number is my identifier. This is an example of federation in the real world uh, where Wells Fargo builds up that relationship and uh, keeps track of the various credentials that I've been issued by people so that they uh, cover their business needs. Identity provider is a term here that, that we're gonna start using and that's simply a server in a foreign domain that provides identity information to other domains. So in, in the real world case, the state of California is an identity provider to banks such as Wells Fargo. Uh, in the digital world, it's, it's different, but we'll cover that now. So what's our touch points for the user uh, as they interact with identity systems uh, that need to support enterprise SSO? There's a number of ways to accomplish this. Uh, one that's becoming quite popular is what's known as identifier first login prompts. Uh, Google adopted this a, a few years ago and it's become common throughout the web. It's not the only way to do it, but, but I like it, so that's, that's what I'm gonna illustrate here and the changes that it, it introduces. So in this case, a, a user sees a flow like this. Sally comes to our website, and now instead of seeing a username and password field, she sees a simple email address and a login button. She enters her email address and the next screen she sees is a way to log in to her corporation. In this case, Contoso is her employer. She sees her login box at Contoso. She logs in at Contoso and then sees that, her projects as she always did before. The network requests get a little bit more complicated here. Uh, the first one, instead of actually being a password verification, is simply a way to initiate SSO. So her email address is simply submitted to the server. The server then does a lookup. Who's the identity provider for Contoso.com? That's found, and Sally is redirected to her IDP, her corporate sign-on server. In this case, this is an open ID authentication request. I'm gonna use that because that's kind of the newest and more modern protocol that, that people seem to be adopting. You could accomplish the same functionality with SAML and that's deployed in a lot of cases. Uh, the protocol mechanics don't really matter. It's, it's more around the functionality. In this case, we're authenticating users with, with their corporate IDP. So Sally gets redirected over there. She logs in and Contoso validates everything. Uh, Contoso might apply other security policies such as step-up authentication and challenge her uh, with MFA depending on the application that she's trying to ask. All of, all of that is up to Contoso to decide what their, what their security policy is. If everything checks out, then Contoso redirects uh, Sally back to the application she wanted to access and the application can now identify the fact that Sally has logged in. In OpenID Connect, this happens via what's known as an ID token. There's some mechanics that go on here of, of how you get that, uh, but what's, all that's happening here is that um, Acme.com is relying on Contoso, uh, Sally's employer, to authenticate Sally, and then Contoso conveys that information that Sally has successfully authenticated, and this is her information. So the key bits, again, from, from the digital identity is the issuer field, which is Contoso.com, and the subject, which is Sally's identifier. And finally, Sally can now see her projects, all the, all the technical considerations have kind of checked out and, and she can access the application. One of the things that you'll notice here is that um, we continue to set a session cookie uh, in, in the request to the, to the dashboard. So we continue to do authentication as Sally uh, accesses this application as, as we always have. The, nothing changes from the previous kind of simple website. The only thing we've did, done here is modify the login flow to use OpenID Connect rather than just a simple password in a local account. All right, I wanna touch on like the database relations here uh, just to kind of illustrate. Some of this can get a little bit complicated but hopefully it's enlightening and informative. Uh, what happens on that first request, again, when Sally enters her email, what our backend server is doing is, is looking up who the SSO server is for Contoso.com. Uh, 
it finds those records and, and that determines where Sally gets redirected. Now, when, after Contoso then authenticates Sally and redirects us back to Acme, uh, we involve two other tables, the users table and the external identities table. And all this is doing is allowing us to create a local account for Sally as she accesses our application and associate that with the external identity provider. To relate this to my banking example, um, Wells Fargo is obviously keeping track of what my driver's license number and who issued it was. We do the same thing in, in federated scenarios where we, where we keep track of the local user accounts and their external identifiers so that uh, we know what's going on. And here we're just illustrating that. Uh, in this case, 502 is the new uh, local identifier that we assigned to Sally as she used our application. And there's a bit of an indirection here, but uh, this gets back to the organization, in this case, Contoso, who Sally's employer is. The other thing I want to point out, again, this is the session cookie. It, it doesn't change from before. Uh, we continue to simply use the local user identifier, so Sally is identified by 502. The fact that we introduced federation here hasn't changed anything in the subsequent pages and, and anything else in our application. It, it simply affects login. All right, zooming out. Now this is where things get interesting. We don't just have a single domain anymore, and this is where federation becomes important. We have acme.com, which is the application that we've always had. It has its web servers and its database. But now anytime it wants to log in a user from one of its business customers, it federates with another domain. It talks to contoso.com or whoever the employer is to log in those users. It does this using a protocol, OpenID Connect, SAML are both examples of federation protocols that allow us to transfer authentication information between these domains. Uh, the terms that often get thrown around here uh, are identity provider and relying party. If those are confusing, uh, what's basically happening is that Contoso is the identity provider. That's the one who's issuing identifi identifiers and authenticating uh, employer employees. And then Acme.com is relying on that information in order to function. So Acme.com doesn't actually authenticate the users anymore. It just relies on the employer to do it. And we call that the relying party. OAuth also refers to it as a client. So sometimes there's some back and forth. So we've been talking about this term uh, for this whole example, federation. All that is is the act of uh, transferring identity information, usually authentication and authorization information between two different domains. So that's the basics of getting enterprise SSO working and what we have to account for. Again, there's a long list of to-do thing, to-do items that we would have to accomplish to make this fully functional. Um, but we've illustrated how we might evolve from a basic website to something that supports enterprise SSO. Uh, using OpenID Connect. Let's talk about API platforms in integration. So now we've got users signing on to our service. Uh, they're employees of multiple different companies. All those companies have different integration points and they want to build applications and processes that integrate our project management capabilities with, with their line of business. So they want a way now to, to access our APIs. I think it's, it's interesting, someone from a previous talk mentioned that uh, if you look at the, the traffic to salesforce.com today, uh, most of the traffic that's going to salesforce.com is not actually users using the Salesforce integration. It's actually API traffic of all the various uh, vendors that have implemented um, different applications on top of their platform. So APIs become very, very important and oftentimes account for more traffic than just our typical user applications. And it allows us to build out, uh, transform an application into a platform and build out a developer ecosystem. So what does the data model look like if we want to do this? Again, we haven't changed anything from before. The users and projects table remains the same. Uh, the organizations and the tables that we introduced to support SSO also remain the same. But we introduce a couple more tables here in order to deal with applications that now want to integrate with our service. I've used terms from the OAuth specification here, so there's things called clients. Those are basically the applications that we're using that third parties uh, are developing. Resource servers, which represent our APIs. So our project management API would be a resource server. If we have other APIs, we'd have multiple resource servers. And then we have authorization grants, which just track the permissions that users have consented to and issued to the applications that they use. So what does the user interface look like as um, a user might, might encounter authorization as we build out the, our API platforms? 
this is kind of the typical example. You have something like a connect to Acme button that one of our vendors or integrators might put on their website. In this case, we have Fabricam.com who wants to integrate with our project management applications and, and puts, this website on, puts this button on their website. A user will click that. They'll be redirected to Acme.com where we'll collect consent and log the user in. And then finally, the, the user will be returned back to the application that they wanted to access. And Fabricam can, can do integration with, with our APIs. How's this look like? It's a little bit cut off there, but the first request is pretty simple. It's not important. Uh, the user just clicks a button, which initiates this whole process. Uh, this process then does a OAuth authorization request over to our service, acme.com. And at this point, acme.com will step in and log the user in, uh, show consent dialogues, any sort of security policies that we might deem appropriate as an API provider in order to protect uh, the, the user's account. So the user will interact with acme.com to, to fulfill all those obligations. And once it's all fulfilled, uh, the user will be redirected back to Fabricam where they can continue to use the application. Now, uh, for the people paying attention to all the protocol mechanics, you'll notice a lot of similarity here between what happened in this API integration scenario and what previously happened in the enterprise SSO scenario where all of these requests are using a single protocol. In, in this case, it's OAuth, and before we used OpenID Connect, which is just a set of extensions to OAuth. Uh, so the nice thing about using that protocol is that we get a lot of stuff for free because we can uh, just, just share a common set of code bases and a common set of protocols uh, between the two use cases, authentication and authorization. So at the end of this, uh, instead of an ID token that was issued before to identify Sally, uh, we issue an access token. And this access token is then used by Fabricam in, in the offering of their service in order to communicate with Acme.com's APIs. So what happens is you see a bunch of API traffic that might occur from their application on the back end in order to pull out projects and, and then show them on the calendar as, as the example illustrates here. Let's zoom out again. We have two domains just like we had in Enterprise SSO. Uh, in this case, we have acme.com, which, which once again is the service that we've been building. Uh, we've introduced some API servers here that are now separate from our normal web application. And we have Fabricam and, and other vendors that might sit off, off to the side integrating with our API. And they do that by making OAuth requests in order to obtain access tokens. Uh, the, again, the terminology here, uh, Acme's role has kind of been reversed. It's now acting as an identity provider in the sense that uh, it's Acme's users that are granting consent and logging in. And Fabricam is relying on it on Acme, uh, not just for identity information, but also APIs as well in this case. Uh, once again, this to-do list, it, it gets fairly long. Um, there's a bunch of things to factor into when you want to implement a full OAuth uh, server. You need consent pages, token rev revocation, introspection, et cetera. It gets, gets quite long. Now, let's talk about what it means to, to solve both these use cases at the same time. So we can take our basic website and we can add enterprise SSO to it. We can also do API integration, but we're oftentimes going to want to do both at the same time. Uh, and that's typical for really any SaaS application in, in modern requirements. Uh, you're providing a service that you need to log customers into, and all those customers want to integrate uh, your APIs with, with their systems. So to do both of those things, you basically just tie these two scenarios together. We have Acme.com, which is the service that's also providing APIs in this case, and it acts as a relying party to its business customers when employees want to sign on to Acme services. It flips roles and, and acts as an identity provider to the integrators that integrate with Acme.com. So we kind of get, get a chain of, of people relying on each other as they set up the complex relationships that they need to fulfill the, their business objectives. I want to take a little bit of a look at some of the, the session details and the access tokens. Uh, as I said before, like sessions can be somewhat confusing to a lot of developers, and access tokens can also be confusing. What is this new token that's, that's got, gotten introduced to our whole uh, development environment and application as, as we build out these capabilities? Uh, one of the things I want to point out it, is that these things are, are very, very similar. In the case where we were just building a web application, uh, we would set up a session cookie so that the application can, can access our, our back-end services as it needs and as, as the user browses around. Uh, 
in the case of an API, when we start to introduce federation or want to decouple the, the web application itself, uh, we use access tokens, um, typically in an authorization header. You'll notice that these things convey basically the same information. So our cookie before just identified Alice and her local user identifier and the things that we need for our own application. Uh, in the case of an access token, we would issue access tokens to third-party applications, typically, and those include the same set of information. Uh, they include a little bit more detail here, uh, specifically the issuer that's not present in the cookie, and the only reason that that occurs is because the federation scenarios kind of need us to keep track of the, the fact that there's different parties involved. In the cookie case, um, for anyone who's familiar, those are what's called like origin bound to the domain, so it's not necessary to include that information because it's just implicit in, in how the browser operates. All right, so we've gone through this whole thing, we've added SSO capabilities, we've added API capabilities, and we start to see a pattern emerge. That all these tables that we've, we've built up here, they're all for identity information. None of it's particularly interesting to the application that we're building. That project table continues to sit out there and any other tables that are specific to our application, all the complexity has really, really occurred here. So uh, what we can do, however, is that we can just take advantage of this and separate this out as a, as a component, as a service that we can now rely on and all applications can rely on. So we can take that identity information and create um, an identity server, an authentication server, or authorization server that applications can rely on, including our own first-party applications for Acme.com, as well as any uh, third-party applications that our system integrators might build. And so if we take advantage of that pattern and actually extract this component and reuse it across all applications, this list of things that we would have to do to build out identity for, for our application is really things that we don't need to do anymore. Uh, the fact that these standardized protocols exist, we can basically take that authentication server and realize that OpenID Connect and OAuth and other standardized protocols allow us to take all that information out of the application specific uh, areas and just effectively uh, buy it off the shelf. It, it's a common component and commoditized. So developers can focus on building their application while all the identity information is, is completely separate from that. Um, and that's something that, that we obviously at Auth0 provide, um, and that's, that's how we can simplify these identity and access management scenarios to offer things like enterprise SSO and API integration. Questions? No? Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think like it, it's hard to present like complex OAuth cases just in a presentation, so it, you kind of got to distill it down. But I think one of the key points to take away is that that these patterns just just repeat. Like it's the same implementation that you can scale out to as many uh, things as you want. So if we're setting, if we have a hundred different uh, business customers that are accessing our service, we just have to set up the SSO between them. And if you do things like identify or first login, there can be a single login page that you know the user types in their corporate email address and we just redirect to that identity provider. It doesn't have to change sort of um, any of the UIs or any of the things that we have to count for. We're just reusing all the same infrastructure. Yep. Sorry, what was that? Oh, logout? Uh, yeah, so I, I didn't cover that, but um, there's basically, Oftentimes there's kind of two issues. It's like if you're logging into an IDP um, and you log out of that IDP, do you want to be logged out of the applications that you um, logged in with that IDP? It, it can sometimes be different. People have different answers to that question depending on the requirements. But um, OpenID Connect provides protocols for those. So if someone logs out of their you know, corporate identity provider, there's a notification that can travel to the applications that 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 person has logged into and they can terminate those sessions. Um, there's a couple different mechanisms for that, but, but that's definitely something that can be handled by the protocols. It's complicated details under there, but hard to explain in an answer, I guess. <laughs> 
Yeah, so effectively that's kind of the, the same thing if you were to, um, as an application, if a user logged in to you as an application, um, you would just receive a notification that a logout happened. You wouldn't necessarily be aware that um, that was a user-initiated logout or an administrative logout. You'd simply receive the notification and terminate the session. Um, so there might be different tooling on the back end so that administrators can go in and like, look at active sessions or you know, it might happen automatically when a, when a user is deprovisioned, but the sort of logout mechanic would be the, the same. Yeah, so one of the things that, um, this is kind of one of the benefits of getting like a, you know, not implement authentication server yourself. So an authentication server that's, you know, got the full range of functionality will keep track of all the applications that the user has logged into, right? Uh, so when that user logs out, either because they initiated it or an admin did, um, then, the, then the logout notification will be sent to all the applications that were bootstrapped in that session. So it's kind of, um, as many, as many applications as the user is using would, would be logged out. So the applications have to be incremented to receive that message. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, there's, there's two mechanisms for it happening. Um, one is like a back channel logout. So if you have a typical kind of back end based application. Uh, the identity provider, the corporate IDP, whatever the case may be, would, s would basically send an API between those two systems on the back end, and there'd be uh, no involvement on the front end. There's another case where if you're building a, like a single page application that, that might not have a back end, uh, you can receive those notifications via a front end channel too. Uh, to me, like SAML and OpenID are, are the same. Uh, like SAML is deployed a lot today, so like if someone has that, I wouldn't change it. Um, newer applications, probably the recommendation is OpenID Connect, just because it's probably slightly slightly easier from a developer standpoint. It just uses, you know, things things developers today are more familiar with. But yeah. The, so access control is basically like kind of the, the Oh, in terms of Auth0, how, how we've done things. So what Auth0 has is we have what we call rules, which is basically um, when a user logs in uh, to any application, we will execute rules, which are just a set of JavaScript code. So uh, any customer of ours can write whatever JavaScript they, logic they want to look at the user's details and what application they're trying to access and then apply various different rules. So it's all code based in our environment. It's not declarative like um, some other approaches might be. Is that it? All right. Thanks, everyone.